Hello and welcome to the Telecom TV Summit on 6G Research and Innovation. I'm Guy Daniels, Director of Content, and coming up now is our discussion on reconfigurable intelligent surfaces. It's already been touted as the next big thing in cellular, reconfigurable intelligent surfaces or real-time reconfigurable metasurfaces. They promise to dynamically reflect and relay RF signals, actively seeking out receivers such as mobile devices, whilst extending coverage into hard-to-reach areas. But what are the actual use cases, and is the technology ready for commercial development? Well, let's find out what our guests think, and I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Emil Bjornsson, Associate Professor at Linköping University in Sweden, Dr. Mohsen Khalili, Associate Professor of the 5GIC and 6GIC at the University of Surrey, and Dr. Alan Murad, Head of Future Wireless Europe Lab, MD Interdigital UK, and founding member of Etsy's new RSG industry specification group. Hello, everyone. Good to see you all, and thank you for taking part in the programme. Now, we've selected a couple of very promising radio technologies for this year's 6G Research Summit, and we're going to explore one of them now. So, to begin with, can you explain to us what exactly are reconfigurable intelligent surfaces, what they do, and how they work? Alan, why don't you start us off? Okay. Thank you, uh, Guy. So, uh, reconfigurable intelligent surfaces. So, these are surfaces uh, composed of uh, multiple uh, antenna elements. And uh, they are intelligent in the, in the sense that uh, we can uh, optimize their behavior uh, to achieve certain performance optimization. And uh, the third keyword in the naming is reconfigurable, which means we can actually fine tune and adapt that behavior Right, uh, to uh, the targeted use case. Uh, so essentially, uh, these are uh, large surfaces composed of antenna elements, many antenna elements that we can fine tune, reconfigure uh, uh, to achieve a certain uh, performance behavior. Thanks, Alain. Um, Mohsen, this is developing an emerging technology. Have, have you got a slightly different angle on, on, on what constitutes this technology? Yeah, basically these intelligent surfaces or reconfigurable intelligent surfaces, they are uh, electromagnetic metasurfaces which are capable of um, flexible manipulation of an arbitrary electromagnetic wave. So uh, they basically, uh, they are consist of like uh, arrays of tiny, tiny elements, which we call them unit cells and or scatterers. And these uh, unit cells, each of them or cluster of them could be tuned in such a way that the whole surface can reconstruct the beam towards any particular angle. So why we call it the big thing? Because uh, they can sense the environment, they can recycle the electromagnetic wave and without emitting new electromagnetic wave, they can provide sufficient coverage in blind spot. Thanks, Mohsen. So my next question is, you know, why is this of relevance to telecoms? Emil, how can network operators utilize it, this technology you know, in their future 6G networks? So traditionally, you are stuck with the propagation environment that you have. So you put up your base station at a hopefully well-selected place, and then the customers can be anywhere, and you cannot move the buildings. The signal will bounce on them in the way that the buildings were built. But if we can put up this kind of surfaces that are essentially, uh, they are behaving as if you are moving or changing the shape of a wall, for example. But uh, instead, the surface is changing its properties. So it synthesizes that you change the wall. And in that way, you can change how the radio waves makes it from the base station to a mobile phone for a customer. In that way, improve the coverage of yourself by doing this intelligently. Thanks, Emil. Uh, Mosen. Basically, this existing network operator face a significant challenge of ensuring the seamless connectivity, especially in harsh propagation environment where there are lots of tall buildings and trees, uh, especially when we go for higher frequency like millimeter wave and throwers. Also, they are facing of supporting uh, an ever increasing number of users. Uh, and sometimes these users are distributed unevenly in network. So 
And there are different technology to address these kind of issues. Uh, so intelligent reflecting surface is a solution because they can enable the non observed communication uh, and, and they can, uh, I think, in future, uh, they will be play an important role uh, in the network in, in infrastructure because uh, the problem is connectivity and um, you know, co coverage. Alan, this is, sounds like very promising technology. How, how exactly do, do you see operators utilizing it? Yeah, thank you, Gil. Um, so essentially, why is it a big deal uh, to talk about uh, reconfigurable intelligence services, especially for operators? Uh, this is simply because this is a new infrastructure node. And obviously, when we introduce a new infrastructure node, that comes with the whole package of you know, cost, what, what can we do with it, maintain it, uh, integrate it into the existing infrastructure. So that's why it's uh, quite uh, quite a big deal. And uh, it's also important actually to uh, uh, note that uh, reconfigurable intelligence services, they are not, if you like, only uh, envisioned for, if you like, uh, the long term, like the 6G, if you like. So there is in one shape or form, depending on the target use case, for example, you might see already uh, some form of reconfigurable intelligence services already being touted by uh, operators uh, for coverage enhancements, for example, uh, you know, uh, to support enhancement of the coverage of operators in blind spot areas, right? Uh, so it's a big deal because it's introducing a new infrastructure element, uh, very much like repeaters and relays, if you like, uh, and it has a very rich roadmap that starts today, including elements of co commercialization today, and uh, with a uh, roadmap and a journey uh, that will go uh, up until 6G and even beyond 6G uh, when we address actually the technology challenges uh, behind this, uh, this new node, new infrastructure node. It's always exciting when we introduce a new node into our networks like this. Uh, Emil, let me uh, come back to you for some additional comments. Yeah, so this metamaterials that we were mentioning, this is something that is already used commercially for building transmitters and receivers. So, so here the idea is that you place it somewhere in between the transmitter and receiver and create this new kind of relaying type uh, equipment. And uh, then what makes them different from conventional relay? Well, you don't receive the signal, amplify or retransmit. You are instead just reflecting the signal in a controllable manner. In that way, you don't need to divide time into two phases you immediately make the signals where it should be the downside is essentially that since you're not amplifying it you need the surface to be physically larger than a conventional relay in order to collect energy and focus it where it should be okay thanks thanks for that and thanks all of you for, for those comments about why it's of relevance to the operators now you've spoken about the fact that we're already starting to see work in this field work is ongoing Mosen, um, about a year ago, 6GIC premiered a video here on Telecom TV of its state-of-the-art demo, and it was, it was very impressive a year ago. It's still impressive today. What's happened in the intervening 12 months? Uh, well, after that uh, successful demo, which uh, we believe it was the world's first demonstration of dynamic intelligent reflecting surface in real world scenario, we've been working on different challenges related to the IRs. Uh, the first challenge I would like to mention is, although there are few theoretical study for channel modeling uh, for IRS, uh, however, they just provide preliminary insight toward understanding the channel propagation in presence of IRS. Uh, what we did at 6GIC, we uh, performed several channel measurements in indoor and outdoor environment for different, different scenario using our dynamic metasurface to study and capture the complex effect of the channel propagation in real environment. The second thing we did, it was we were working on terahertz uh, IRS and we developed one uh, intelligent surface but operating above 100 gig. Um, and another challenge we try to address is the specular reflection, which I would like to mention it and emphasize on this problem because this problem is one of the uh, you know, critical problem and critical challenge, which all the researchers and scholars need to consider that. The specular reflection, or we can call it high soil level, 
Uh, although we are trying to, you know, redirecting the beam towards any particular angle by, uh, you know, introducing new phase profile for each scatterer. Uh, however, we still have a specular reflection. So this specular reflection is, let's say, for example, if your wave is coming from the base station perpendicular toward your surface, and you are redirecting the beam toward, let's say, 30 degree offside from the bore side then you will still have some reflected wave towards the base station. So uh, we have to minimize this as much as possible because it interferes and also it causes some other problems. So we've been working on developing some technique to reduce this um, specular reflection. Uh, another uh, problem we've been working, because in some occasion, uh, we do need to have like multiple beam or wide beam. Uh, now, if we look at the literature or available studies, and uh, there are mainly only one sharp beam, then we try to just steer it to our different angle. But in some occasion, we do need some multi -beam, multiple beam. For example, in London, you have one meta surface, and there are some incident wave coming from Vodafone O2 E3. E e e so then uh, one beam couldn't afford that much wave. So we develop a technique to uh, design and actually we practically test it on our dynamic meter surface. Mm, uh, we get different multi beams and also we get like uh, one wide beam, which we can scan that wide beam as well. So these are the things we've been working on. Oh, thanks for the update there. Um, Alan, what, what other work do you think is still required in order to bring this promising technology towards commercialization? Well, uh, there is a lot actually uh, that needs to be done, and we are already seeing uh, multiple actually tracks uh, relating to this. Uh, some of the tracks actually are uh, a bit uh, uh, short to midterm, and that's what we are seeing, for example, happening in uh, the 3GPP uh, with uh, RIS uh, manifesting in some of the uh, Release 18 features like uh, smart repeaters and uh, vehicle mounted relays uh, and also partially uh, integrated access backhaul. Uh, so, so there is uh, some activity going around, if you like, uh, RIS when it comes to impacting specifications in the next two, three years or four years. Uh, but at the same time, if you were to exploit, if you like, the full potential of RIS and assess actually the benefits of RIS and what are the killer use cases of RIS. So this is more of a forward looking effort that uh, several EU research projects uh, have been uh, working on, uh, but also outside Europe and the UK, uh, in Asia and in the United States. Uh, so uh, there is quite some pre-standard activity going on this space to try to main, you know, to uh, streamline all these research efforts and see where the gaps are and uh, what the challenges are uh, so that we uh, exploit the full potential, if you like, uh, of, of the RIS. And one of these uh, uh, key efforts, pre-standard efforts, is the Etsy RIS ISG effort that uh, was approved by the Etsy uh, Director General in June uh, 2021. And uh, this ISG is, uh, was launched uh, uh, at the end of September uh, for a period of uh, two years. So this uh, industrial specification group is uh, uh, positioned as a bridging uh, effort uh, for all these research efforts uh, happening all over the globe uh, to try to uh, uh, you know, assess uh, uh, where the standard impact is, uh, how do we differentiate this from, uh, let's say, repeaters, relays, uh, other kind of uh, uh, infrastructure nodes, and uh, where to take risks uh, for, uh, uh, you know, standardization and specification if uh, that uh, specification need arises. So this is, if you like, an effort that we will see uh, driving um, uh, our understanding on uh, where the gaps are for us and how we take it forward uh, in terms of further specification and uh, commercial deployment. Okay, thanks Thanks for the update as, as well, Alan. Emil, um, we've obviously got a lot of work still ahead of us to, to bring the, the, the whole system into into commercialization. And, and as, as, uh, as, as Alan said, there's pre-standards work going on. Now, I know you're involved in the uh, IEEE um, work on RIS as well. So can you give us a, perhaps an update of, of, of what you think 
work work is still required how far away are we perhaps from from seeing commercialization yes so this is a topic that uh, i think people that like me were working in the communication society on 5g topics and then 5g arrived and now we look for 60 people jumped onto this research topic and quickly tried to do a lot of research but then it's also have been a field where different kind of misconceptions have been spreading around. People are trying to move more quickly than we should be in order to get a stable technology. So I was writing a magazine article in Communication Magazine last year about some of these myths and also what I think are the, the two main thing. And one of them is, as we were talking about, what is the real use case? Because I think for 5G, what were the things that were actually successful? It was things like massive MIMO millimeter wave, uh, things that we know from the beginning that one can be used to multiplex many users, one can be used to have access to more bandwidth. But here, yeah, we can reflect signals. Sure. And we could do that with relays, but what is the real killer application here that we couldn't do before? And I think this is one of the things where we we know what we can do, but we don't know what RIS is inherently good at compared to the competing technologies. And the other thing I was also pointing out in this article was that uh, it's easy to say that, we yeah, we can reconfigure it these surfaces and if we do it we can achieve this and that but how do we actually do this in real time this is one of the important challenges and i think that the demonstration that most of was showing last year was uh, an eye opener that you, yes you can actually do it at least in a certain environment the question is how you would build this into existing standards Yes, in telecoms we do like to imagine future use cases and we spend a lot of time thinking about these even though the most popular applications turn out to be things we never even thought of. Alain, do we yet have a compelling use case for RIS? Yeah, most certainly. If you just uh, put, if you like, uh, RIS uh, as a framework and it's, uh, you know, most simple and uh, low hanging fruit, if you like, uh, 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 kind of, uh, you know, a node, which would be a repeater or a relay. So the, the most uh, immediate use case is about uh, coverage enhancement. Right, uh, and even more uh, when it comes to uh, high frequencies, right, uh, where uh, high frequencies suffer from, uh, you know, blockage, right. So this is, if you like, a most immediate use case. But uh, at the same time, actually, this use case uh, raises a question of, you know, why RIS and how RIS is any different, if you like, from a uh, you know repeater or a relay. Uh, why we wouldn't just go for smart repeaters, for example. That, that's, for example, what the 3HPP is doing today in its release 18 uh, activity. Now, the beauty of uh, RIS is uh, that it opens the door for many more use cases that are yet to be proven and to be executed and to be demonstrated and trialed, uh, such as, for example, uh, positioning and navigation, uh, uh, wireless power transfer, Right, uh, super directivity, uh, proper beam tracking. Um, uh, so all these kind of use cases, if you like, uh, we couldn't do them today, and these are not in the scope of, you know, traditional and conventional nodes like relays and repeaters. Right. Uh, so that's why, if you like, the potential of risks uh, in terms of uh, target application and, and use cases is really, really wide. Uh, but uh, they are yet to be proven uh, in all these use cases. So how do we achieve a centimeter level accuracy uh, with RIS uh, for positioning, right? Uh, how we ensure that we can, uh, you know, uh, point uh, beams and transfer wire, you know, uh, power over that wireless link from the RIS to the, to the user. So all these are forward looking and I wouldn't expect these to be, if you like, uh, 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 get uh, resolved or solved uh, technically uh, in less than five, five to, uh, to, to seven years time frame. Thank you. And Emil, what are your thoughts here? So I've not been able to figure out what is the best use case, but I have been analyzing when I think these surfaces under what circumstances performs the best. And I think when I have discovered is that if you already have a strong signal between the transmitter and the receiver, the RS will not ben uh, or provide much more stronger signals. So you need to focus on scenarios where you already have a weak signal, and then you can get the stronger signal through the RS. Moreover, 
you have an RS that's essentially doing analog beam steering, which means that uh, you preferably would like to have a scenario where there is only one strong direction that reaches the wrist, and there is only one strong direction where you want the signal to be reflected towards. And what would that be? Well, it'd be essentially when you have line of sight uh, to and from the wrist. So the base station sees the wrist, the user sees the wrist, but they don't see each other, the base station, the user. And moreover, in this situation, you also can handle a lot of bandwidth because that is also the issue with beam steering in the rich propagation environment that you have so many paths, so you can only lock on one of them. Okay, thank you. And Mosen, you've already spoken about some of the, the, the challenges that this technology throws up, and you've also given us an indication of the work you're doing at the moment. Do you, do you work towards specific use cases? Do you have specific use cases, possible use cases, that steer your research direction? Yeah, besides the actually the use cases mentioned by Elena and Emil, there is another interesting use cases for outdoor to indoor coverage. Because uh, just let's imagine when we go for higher frequency like millimeter wave or terahertz. And so there is a little chance to for the signal to get through from let's say window or from the building because there are a huge attenuation. So these surfaces are not only reflecting surface, uh, they, they could be designed in such a way that um, they transmit the signal, they let the signal through the um, windows and then they can improve the coverage. So also we, uh, we design and develop one transmissive surface because these uh, tiny elements, which are metamaterials, uh, they can be simply coated on a window so we develop a transparent one. So we use some specific material as a scatterer, and then um, we, we examined it, and we found that yeah, we can simply uh, improve the millimeter wave coverage in indoor environment. And so uh, this is, I think, would be one interesting use case. Another use case, I don't uh, think so. We mainly need the dynamic version of the RIS. Maybe in some occasion we do need them. But if uh, we know, usually we know where are the blind spots with just with some simple network planning, we can, um, you know, we can get the flavor of the network in, in particular area. So we can design the static version of these surfaces to provide coverage for one particular area. Uh, and uh, those surfaces, they don't require any power. So compared to the relay nodes or even like, um, other te other available techniques, they don't need any power consumption, and also they don't interfere with the like backholings. They don't need, they don't require backhaul system. So I think these two use cases would be much um, uh, feasible based on you know based on the knowledge we have now. Okay, thank you. And let me let me turn over to Emil. So I think in general, one should think about this as a way of engineering the communication channel between transmitter and receiver. In, in addition to just trying to get more signal energy through to the receiver, you can think about other properties that you can also try to improve, such as uh, you can let the surface rotate the polarization of the signal. So if you have a dual polarized antenna at the receiver, you will get too strong paths to it. Or in other ways, you have this issue that, yeah, with millimeter wave, you can squeeze in many antennas into your device, but the channels that uh, you will have in this situation are usually rather sparse. So you can only see one signal from your base station. But then you put up the surface and you create an additional strong path, which you receive. And in that way, you can transmit twice the amount of data through the different paths. Oh, that's interesting. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Um, now, yesterday we had a session uh, looking at terahertz spectrum and terahertz communications. Do we think that RIS RIS will be closely tied into the use of terahertz spectrum? Are these two areas going to be mutually dependent in the future, do we think? Uh, perhaps I could start, um, Alan, perhaps I could start with you. Okay. Uh, for a short answer, uh, I don't think they are tightly coupled. Uh, and we can already actually tell uh, uh, from the interests of uh, the operators, for example, uh, as we uh, uh, we observed into this uh, Etsy ISG RIS, uh, the primary use cases for them is around uh, the conventional spectrum, which is the sub six gigahertz uh, spectrum, right? So not on, on the terahertz and the sub terahertz, uh, uh, if you like, uh, spectrum. Now. Uh, uh, 
certainly when we move up in the frequencies, uh, there is a significant benefit uh, on the form factor because uh, as we discussed earlier, so these surfaces to be uh, to, 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 pro to provide a, a gain or a benefit, they have to be uh, pretty much uh, large surfaces. And um, obviously, uh, large surfaces means many elements, and these elements depend upon the wavelength, which depends upon uh, the frequencies. So the higher we go into the frequencies, uh, the, uh, the better the, the form factor, the smaller the form factor is going to be, which means that these uh, surfaces are easy uh, to deploy and, and, and get, uh, you know, uh, get into the infrastructure. Uh, further on, actually, when you move up into the frequencies, uh, as it was just mentioned earlier by uh, Emil, uh, that uh, you know, uh, since uh, the beams become uh, quite uh, directional, uh, and there is uh, pretty much uh, this line of sight, so you could uh, also envisage uh, to benefit uh, from uh, you know uh, the the risk surfaces uh, to provide another strong line of sight, if you like, to the uh, to the user, so that uh, it kind of uh, doubles or you know the capacity or the or, or the bandwidth, if you like. Uh, so uh, you know you would uh, benefit significantly uh, from risks uh, to support. Uh, for example, uh, gaming uh, gaming scenarios uh, at home, for example, uh, right? Uh, so uh, there is a nice, if you like, uh, marriage between, uh, if you like, higher frequencies and uh, RIS, right? Uh, but uh, it doesn't mean uh, all RIS applications are dependent upon, uh, you know, developments uh, in the higher frequencies. So very much uh, the next, uh, I would say, uh, commercialization uh, use cases around this uh, would be in the uh, lower frequency range, uh, sub six gigahertz. Okay, so what you're saying is, is that that risk doesn't depend on on terahertz. Although terahertz communications could could benefit from from uh, the use of of risk. Uh, Emil, do you do you see the, a, a similar um, situation here? I would say that yes, it's true that uh, the higher you go up in the frequency range, the smaller becomes each of these unit cells. But that doesn't mean that you can have a smaller form factor if you want to maintain your link budget. It's essentially like you should think about it as a solar panel that collects energy. The larger it is, the more energy it collects. So even if you have a higher frequency range, should every unit cell become smaller, you still need to fill up the same area to collect the same amount of energy and beam form in the same manner. Then in general, terahertz communications, I'm not really a big believer in that, uh, not for end users. I think it's, yes, it's great in order to send a lot of information between a base station and another base station perhaps, but uh, for end users, wouldn't the gigabits per seconds that you can deliver with millimeter wave uh, frequencies be enough? Uh, I, I don't see any real use cases that we can imagine in the coming years that we require per user more than say 20 gigabit per second at five you can already deliver. So. I think terabits is more, or terahertz is more for uh, backhaul links where you don't have so much mobility. So then you don't need this kind of flexibility in terms of change in the propagation environment because you already know what the transmitter and receiver will be. Okay, thank you. And uh, Mosen, you, you spoke earlier when you were talking about the work you're doing that you'd already been testing uh, your, your metasurfaces with, with terahertz. Do, do you see a linkage here? Actually, the... Um... For terahertz, there are lots of actually application uh, which we need a uh, terabit per second link, like for example, for queues downloading or uh, like for teleportation, we need, uh, you know, multi gigabit per second, which millimeter wave uh, was not able to deliver. And another important thing about the terahertz, uh, yeah, of, of course, we have a huge bandwidth available there but they suffer from high pass loss and they could simply block and there's no shadowing the shadowing it would be like a blockage in this range but uh, so and as uh, alan and uh, emil mentioned that the terrors would be mainly dealing with the line of sight communication but we can simply um, enable non line of sight communication and we did it and we've seen there is a, like a huge potential here 
And I think uh, in, yeah, I do agree with Emil. We have a sparse channel for millimeter wave and terahertz strength, but we did several channel measurement and we did a practical test on millimeter wave and terahertz. And we, we have we seen some multipass. So we, and uh, we seen some strong actually, um, yeah, we mm, multipass, not only the line of sight. So uh, the non line of sight communication can be uh, provided by using this intelligent reflecting surface. And because uh, usually we know where is the base station are, so we don't need actually to have like a dynamic version of this for terahertz because we are uh, talking about very short range communication. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's obviously, it's very apparent already that RIS is already a serious contender for future 6G technology, and I believe it's already a RAN candidate for 3GPP REL18. So it's in a way, it's pre-6G at the moment. Um, now, we've spoken about what Etsy is doing with its um, new ISG, uh, also what the uh, IEEE work is doing. Uh, th one other factor that's that's creeping into discussions about 6G now is, a, is, is the, the green network and, and lowering power consumption. That seems to be a, a big a big issue moving forward. Do we think, and Emil, perhaps I could uh, start asking about you this first as a final, a final question to you. Do, do we think that um, RIS has the potential to help alleviate power budgets and, and power consumption by operators? At least it is a piece of equipment that is believed to consume little energy as compared to power amplifiers that we need in relay, for example. Then since it is sort of improving the coverage, yeah, you can save energy in the sense that if you need to transmit a certain amount of data, you can transmit it faster and then you can put the equipment to sleep. So in that way, you can collect energy. I think one of the the issues that I've come across when I talk with people in the industry about this technology is that unless you can push the energy consumption of a RIS all the way down to zero, or at least to the point where you don't need to have a dedicated power supply, then they don't find it that much different from a conventional small cell or something else where you need to take a power cable there. So that is one of the interesting things, can we make these ones so lean in terms of energy consumption so that they will essentially be energy neutral? Maybe collect energy from the environment and then uh, you use them for your operation for a while. And if you can achieve this, then it will be a very green type of technology. Otherwise, there is a risk that this technology is not really improving the energy efficiency if you still need to consume a lot of energy and uh, it uh, yeah, compared to other technologies like putting up another small cell at the place where you are thinking about putting up the risks might actually provide you with lower energy consumption total. Thank you for that, Emil. And uh, Alan, I know it's early days with the Etsy ISG, but is the, uh, is the power consumption issue a factor that might be under consideration when, when you investigate risks? Yeah, absolutely, actually. And that's, uh, if you like, uh, how risk has been defined in this Etsy RSIG to be a surface uh, that is uh, composed of mostly passive uh, elements. So the key point here is, uh, or the key word here is passive or almost passive uh, with the aim um, uh, for these uh, surfaces to be, uh, you know, uh, as little consuming as a power as possible uh, so that they have an attractive uh, commercial use case. So definitely the green aspect uh, is, uh, is there from uh, ultra low power consumption, uh, but also from the angle that uh, Emil just uh, mentioned in terms of uh, leveraging these surfaces for, if you like, recycling some of the radio waves uh, uh, energy uh, and uh, make use of this, uh, you know, to support uh, a lower energy footprint uh, for the operator. Well, that's a good point for us to end our discussion on. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll bring it to a close now. Thank you all for participating and sharing your views and opinions on what is an incredibly interesting topic. Now, if you're watching this on day two of our Telecom TV Summit on 6G research and innovation, then don't forget to send us any questions you have on this subject, and I'm sure you've got a lot of questions. We'll try and answer them in our live after show program later today. And please take part in our online poll. You'll find it below this video player window next to the Q&A app. So we'll be back later for the after show. Until then, thank you for watching and goodbye.